Okay, welcome to the Pat Dooley Show. We're halfway through the season, and uh, it's like I said, it always flies by. Seems like yesterday we were at the SEC Media Days in Hoover, Alabama, and now it's halfway through the season. Your Gators are four and two. If you're a Gator fan, if you're not, I'm surprised you're watching the show. Uh, obviously, not the not the result you expected or, or wanted out in Baton Rouge. I can't say it's stunning that Florida got steamrolled out there and emptied. This is another stadium they've emptied uh, because uh, the fans started going home. You know, with about five minutes ago, it was it was uh, such a blowout. But to lose back-to-back -back games by the most they've lost since 1971, uh, when Doug Dickey was the coach, and that was that was the John Reeves, Carlos Alvarez senior year. Alvarez was pretty much shot. The whole team was in disarray, and they got just killed by Auburn and Georgia in back-to-back -back games. And that, no, it's never been that bad since then, so I guess Will Muschamp has set a record here of some kind. Although not all the blame goes to him, certainly, or the coaching staff. The players got to want to play. They've got to try to play better. But uh, look, these two teams that Florida played the last two weeks are really, really good teams. Uh, are they the best in the country? Well, they'll find that out. I think Oklahoma's right there. I think Wisconsin's right there. Uh, and Stanford might be right there, but the bottom line is they are really good. And Florida is not right now, especially without a starting quarterback well, and, and its backup quarterback. Uh, you know, when the, when the game started, we were like sitting there, and we knew Brissett was probably going to be the starter. Nobody thought, wow, Brissett's going to lead him to this unbelievable victory. Uh, but if they could just keep it close, well, within four possessions, it wasn't close already. You know, Florida goes three and out. Uh, they hit uh, the long pass. To Randall, and again, again, this is a part of the problem. It's something I'm writing about uh, Wednesday. Or I wrote about Wednesday for Thursday, and that is uh, Pop Saunders, who's a true freshman and who missed the last game under suspension, doesn't carry out his assignment, leaves a guy wide open as a safety. So there's a touchdown. Florida goes three and out again and runs on third and ten, which is almost like the white flag coming out. And then LSU scores again, and it's pretty much over. You get, you get the fake punt, yada, 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 and uh, wasn't much fun for the Gators. The one touchdown Florida got, I, I think it was a little bit of a fluke in that, in that Claiborne fell down trying to push DeBose out of bounds, got him out of bounds, but he, you are allowed to come back in if you get forced out. So they get the 65-yard touchdown pass. Two weeks in a row, they've had a 65-yard touchdown pass and not much else. So we'll see where the Gators go from here. Obviously... We know where they go, and that is to Auburn, Alabama. And, uh, you know, Auburn's struggling a little bit too, a little bit of a hangover from the national championship. But, uh, you know, this is a winnable game for Florida. I mean, Auburn's having trouble at quarterback. They're not sure who they want to go with. When you look at uh, their situation defensively, they had the one really good game against South Carolina that surprised everybody, then went back to form last week against Arkansas and got throttled by them. So there's a chance for Florida to win this game. I mean, probably easily, in my mind, the best chance they've had the last three weeks to win. Uh, but Florida teams have gone out to Auburn before and not done well, as you know. Uh, 19, uh, well, 1993, you never forget that one. That one wasn't even on TV because of probation involving Auburn. and Everybody was watching it back here on the, uh, on the Jumbotron. Uh, and certainly the O. One team, which was a great team. I still think the best Florida team that never won anything was the 2001 team. They lost out there when Ernest Graham was out with an injury. And then um, the, uh, the 06 national champions went out there and lost in a controversial game. But uh, they lost. I mean, Auburn's a tough place to play. And Florida has not had a lot of luck there. Didn't even win a game there until 1973. And I remember what a huge deal that was when Florida finally beat Auburn at Jordan-Hare Stadium with Don Gaffney as a quarterback playing it starting his first game. So it'll be tough. It'll be tough for the Gators. You know, they've gone up against Trent Richardson. They've gone up against LSU with like five tailbacks coming at them. And now they get Michael Dyer and Ontario McCaleb. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but uh, I think Florida's at least taking a step down in class. Not a huge step down, not going all the way to Kentucky down, which I think they could use a game like that right now. But uh, it's, a, it's a big game because if Florida loses, it's pretty much over for the East. Now they're just trying to get bowl eligible, maybe knock off a rival down the stretch. Uh, but if they win, they're still in it and uh, have that big game against Georgia. I'm sure these guys need the open week, uh, like every, all of us do, and just to kind of heal up and, and kind of mentally heal up. And that'll be coming up next week. So no show next week, no Pat Dooley show next week because it is an open week. We all need a little bit of time off. 
Now, the result that surprised me the most, it was a good day of watching college football. We watched the uh, Texas-Oklahoma game pretty much on the laptop. By the time we got there, it was a blowout. We were able to go to Tiger Stadium. They had several TVs, watched all the games there, watched a couple of games on the laptop while the Florida game was going on. We're just, you know, going back and forth. And then on the way back in the, in the traffic, watched um, a lot of Tennessee, Georgia, got back to the, the Fox and the Hound, which is our new favorite sports bar to watch the end of that game, Auburn, Arkansas, Nebraska and Ohio State. So we, we saw plenty of college football. A lot of times on these road trips you miss so much, but we were able to see so much of it. But the one thing that stunned me, that blew me away, was Wake Forest beating Florida State. Uh, you know, I was watching Jimbo Fisher's coach's show the other day, and he was talking about how the wind was against them no matter which way they were going. If you're blaming the wind, you got problems. You got bigger problems than the wind. But uh, that's, we're going to talk about that later in the show. I, I am amazed. I, I knew that FSU wasn't as good as people were saying but I didn't think they were two and three. I never saw that coming, so I'm stunned by that result. We'll get into that with our panel a little bit later. But right now it's time for three things. All right, it's time for three things, three things that I thought over this weekend of college football. And the number one is that Oklahoma may be 1C. You know, LSU and Alabama, 1A, 1B, you can argue about who's better. The good thing is we'll get to see on the field November 5th. Uh, I think Alabama's just a touch better than LSU. I like their linebackers better. But after watching Oklahoma, now I've watched Oklahoma, you know, go into a, the, probably the toughest atmosphere any of these teams have had to play. And Alabama at Florida, probably similar. But go into Tallahassee and win that game uh, and then come back and, and go to the Cotton Bowl and that Red River rivalry and just de demolish Texas. Now, it was a reality check for Texas. They had gotten a ten, number 10 ranking based on wins over teams that beat them last year but should never have beaten them. They were probably overrated going into that game, but for Oklahoma just to seal club them like that, you got to give them a lot of credit. And they've got a couple, I mean, they beat Texas. They've, uh, they, you know, they went over Florida State, obviously. Uh, they've got good wins. So I, I, don't, I don't know that there's any separation there. And, you know, it's funny because you got LSU, Alabama, Oklahoma, I, who's going to argue with, that whiskey doesn't belong in there? I mean, Wisconsin w with Russell Wilson is a different team. They're, they usually used to be the kind of team you go, yeah, 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 but they're, they don't excite me. They excite you now. And then Stanford. I, I've seen very little of Stanford. I watched a little bit of their game the other night, but uh, they're really good as well. I'm sorry I can't include Boise in the argument. I'm just not going to do it. It's just me. It's not anything against Boise, but... When you see what Florida, what LSU had to deal with this week with Florida, when you see Alabama go into, into Gainesville and win, and then they've, got a, they've already beaten Arkansas, and now they're going to have to beat LSU. Come on, it's, there's no comparison. It's, it's, it's like high school and college football. Number two, Tennessee's in big trouble. Um, you know, when, when Tennessee started the season fast, we thought, well, maybe, maybe, they may be a little bit better than we thought, and then Florida handled them. And you still kind of weren't sure. Well, the loss to Georgia, while Georgia didn't handle them, they had a couple of really big possessions that they hit on and, and got the lead. Tennessee struggled offensively. But now Tyler Bray's out with a broken thumb. Their next three games, LSU, Alabama, South Carolina. I mean, they may be struggling for bowl eligibility. They always get that back-ended schedule where they get uh, Kentucky and Vandy, but they, they're going to need every one of those games to get eligible. It's going to be another tough season for Derek Dooley. And number three, the state of Florida uh, is not good. We all know, not just the Gators, obviously, but the fact that uh, it's been much publicized for the first time since 1982, no team from the state of Florida is ranked. Combined, they are 8-8. Eight and eight. Combined, they're not very good defensively. I, we all thought FSU was going to be really good defensively. And it's turned out the last two weeks in a row, they've given up 35 points. We've seen Miami not be able to stop anybody but Ohio State, which is uh, offensively challenged. And, of course, we saw Florida give up 464 rushing yards in the last two games. That's why all these teams aren't ranked, is their defenses aren't very good right now. And, you know, for, for them not to be ranked, I know everybody's freaking out about it, but they shouldn't be ranked. And to be honest with you, I'm not totally stunned none of them are ranked. I, I, I always figured FSU would, would lose to Oklahoma but still be kicking around and be in the, you know, the second 20, but that loss to Wake is devastating. The funny thing is, the last time they weren't ranked was 1982. Florida's record at the time was 8-3. and three. And they actually had some of the most memorable wins in Florida football history. The, the James Jones catch. They had won at FSU, and they had to turn sprinklers on to get the Gator fans off the field. This was a Wilbur Marshall year when he had his breakout game against Southern Cal here in the Swamp. With all that, all that great stuff happening, 
uh, it was a, they weren't ranked at the end of the year. So uh, when you lose 44 nothing to Georgia, that's going to knock you out of the rankings. All right, that's going to do it for three things. We're going to move to our panel now where we're going to talk to Noah Brandeis and Brady Ackerman. Okay, welcome back to the Pat Dooley Show. We have an esteemed panel here today, a couple former Florida football players. To my left, Noah Brindeis, who uh, went to Auburn and got a win as a quarterback. Big win. Way back in the old days. Uh -huh. 14 years ago. Do they have leather helmets in? Or? Yeah, leather helmets, <laughs> no face masks. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, Brady Ackerman, you know, from the Gator sidelines, and, of course, uh, also has his own show and his own station down in Ocala, WMOP, WGGG. Yeah, and I was there to see... Uh, I was too. Noah to win that game. You know, so, I remember the most of anything was walking down the stands after the, at the end of the game. You know, it was like two minutes to go and the game's over. And the Auburn fans just complaining about Terry Bowden. <laughs> they were so bad. This is a guy who just gone 21 and 1 for yeah. him like two years yeah. earlier. Kind of like what's going on there now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what about that game? I mean, when you came to that game and Jesse Palmer was going to be the starter. Uh, much like he was kind of the Jacoby Brissett of his day at the time. Yeah. <laughs> Out of nowhere, is going to be the starter. Were you thinking you were going to play? Yeah, I, I was. I just kind of had that feeling through the week that I was disappointed in the beginning of the week that I wasn't starting in the first place. But, it, you know, it worked out okay. Uh, but I prepare, you know, you hear all the backups say all the time, I'm going to prepare to be the starter. But I, I really did that week take an extra interest because I had a feeling that something was going to happen out there. And, you know, knowing Coach Burr, his uh, – his ability to make the switch is legendary, as we yes. saw last week. Yes. But uh, so yeah, it was one of those games where I kind of knew going in that I would probably have to make some plays. The game where famously Jacquez Green ran through and caught touchdown. Right. Thank touchdown. God, mm -hmm. thank God for Quezzy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, our five topics today. We'll start with the first one. Uh, Florida obviously having a lot of problems defensively, giving up 464 yards of rushing in the last two games. Uh, Brady, we'll start with you. Are these defensive problems fixable? I think they are because you have to look at the size of LSU and Alabama, the size of their running backs and the nature of which they play the game. You're not going to see that type of power backs. You're going to see some good backs in Lattimore and Dyer, but you're not going to see that kind of strength. And, and I think the biggest disappointment for Muschamp after the game and what he was talking to me about was the defensive line not striking and doing their responsibility. And I think it's, they're still very young. They're still learning. So, yeah, I think it's fixable. Is it a little bit too no? I mean, uh, this is something I, I'm writing in Thursday's paper. The, this, these de de defensive linemen that are – they're five-star guys in all this, but they haven't, only, they haven't had that much time in the weight room. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Other than Jay Howard, who's probably played the best of them, they haven't gone through three summers and three, uh, you know, falls of getting bigger and stronger. Exactly, Pat. And, and the big thing you can't simulate in practice or in the weight room or in the meeting rooms is those, is those big offensive linemen from LSU and Alabama right. uh, leaning on them. And those guys are, are well coached. I mean, they're five-star players as well. And uh, they have a great system and they're, they're built on being physical. So I think it's just more so, you know, our young D linemen getting used to the physical SEC inside running game against the good teams. And, you know, not every team's as good as LSU and Alabama. No, and it doesn't help that you've got a true uh, freshman at corner. You have a true freshman at safety. Your other corner, technically, you're, go, you're without the guys who should be your two starting corners, and Janoris Jenkins and, and Jeremy Brown. So none of that helps. Uh, and, but I know that I, I was listening to your show the other day, Brady, and you were talking about the linebackers and how it's hard to judge them because of what's happening up front. But I'm still waiting for linebackers to make plays. Yeah, no, definitely. I think uh, you saw – they make a change in the second half last week with mm -hmm. Michael Taylor getting a lot of reps right. because the biggest problem these guys have is because they can't see where they're going, they're going up into the hole too high. And then when they engage the running back, they're getting dragged backwards exactly. with the linemen. So, yeah, these guys, they, it's all connected in defense. It starts up front and it's connected to the middle. The one thing I did hear on the sideline in listening to Dan Quinn and those guys talk to the defensive line is what happens is, as he was saying, after, as the guys were leaning on them, instead of still sticking to their responsibilities, they started guessing to try to make a play, to try to make, because it's frustrating for the D linemen. Sure. And when they did that, they got gashed. And they, a couple of times they guessed on consecutive plays, got offsides penalties, and gave yeah. them a first down. Yeah. You know, here, here, don't snap the ball. We'll, we'll give you 10 more sure. yards. So uh, that certainly was an issue as well. We'll go to the second topic, which is, uh, you know, when you're losing and you've lost two straight games as bad as they've lost, your head coach is going to get a lot of second guessing. He's getting a lot of second guessing, um, Noah, because of his behavior on the sidelines. We've seen him <laughs> screaming at players, screaming at coach, or coaches. Yes, DJ Durkin got an earful. Screaming at the referees uh, after the game, calling out a couple of players, not by name, but by saying that they weren't going to play anymore. I think what he meant was we're sitting them down because of this, and then we'll see. 
But I mean, is he? Does he need to become more head coach like? Well, I think he will, but I think you got people have to be careful about about wanting that because we, we love so much the the excitable Will Muschamp went on games we were winning, and yeah. now when yeah. we see the other side of it, uh, you know, people are, are pulling the other card out, but. You know, I think it's one of those things. He's a first-time head coach. Um, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. I think a lot of people want to play for him because of that. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be some, some bad moments uh, where some things happen on the sidelines that maybe he wishes he wouldn't have done. But he'll learn from that. And I, I still think that, that his enthusiasm for the game, his passion, it shines through. And, and even in those bad moments, it's still somebody that I would love to play for. You guys both played for a guy who did not hold back his emotions either, and visors flew, and, mm -hmm. and you know, yeah. headsets flew. Sometimes at you. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I, what do you think about it? Well, I think it's, I mean, regardless of what people say, I agree with Noah. He's a first time head coach. There's nothing that can prepare you for what he's going through. As much as he learned from Saban, as much as he learned of being at great programs like LSU and, and Alabama, you've not been in this situation. So there may be some things that he cuts back on as he goes forward. Um, but the one thing he's trying to do is, is, is coach them hard to get them to the right place. So when your program becomes deep-rooted, you don't have to coach quite as hard. You don't have to fire your guys up. You don't have to get in their face as much if your program is deep-rooted. I think this is a transition year from one staff and era to another, and I think he has to coach that way. Which is the point I made in my column uh, in Tuesday's paper is that he lost to a coach in, in Nick Saban who's been there five years as coach 17. Les Miles, who's been there seven years as coach of These guys have built programs to this point and have won national titles. He's starting out. This is the very beginning of it. And, and you know, Nick Saban, we see him do a lot of yelling. And we certainly have seen uh, Jimbo Fisher, who's another Saban prodigy, do a lot of yelling. So I think it's just when you lose, right? then people go, that's no good. You're right. going to hurt recruiting. Right. And I think if we all looked at it, too, we, we say, well, at the beginning of the year, if we're sitting there at four and two at this point, you wouldn't have been surprised. I don't, I don't think anybody would have been surprised. No, I'm probably pretty happy. But when you lose two games by the biggest margin since 1971, that's when. That's well, that keeps you busy, Pat. Yeah, yeah. I had to look it up. That wasn't easy. <laughs> All right, number three on our list of uh, topics here: Who has had a more surprising unbeaten season so far, Kansas State or Georgia Tech, uh, Noah? <sighs> Well, I watched Georgia Tech play actually in person. Uh, the Western Carolina Catamounts, where my brother plays, played them first game of the year. And, and, and they run their offensive system about as well as anybody I've ever seen. And they know what they're doing. They don't run a bunch of plays. They run their triple option stuff, their inside trap, and, and they get on the perimeter with some sweeps. They, and that's what they do. And if you can stop them, God, God bless you, because not many people can. So I think the fact that, that they're undefeated to me um, is probably a little more surprising, although the, the schedule in the ACC is, is not exactly proven to be uh, too difficult for them yet. But, you know, Kansas State's a good program. Bill Snyder's got them back playing well. And they've been there before. But Georgia Tech, I think, to me, is more surprising. How, how, about, how about the fact that how hard Georgia Tech it is to prepare for? Because you don't prepare for that. Exactly. You, you play one team a year. Um, that runs that offense. Right. So what you almost have to do is during your bye week or during spring practice, set aside a few days to just practice against that. So the guys have seen it, you know, coming into game week. You're not showing up at a Tuesday practice trying to get ready to defend that offense. Brady, Kansas State opened a season by beating somebody like, I think it was Eastern Illinois yeah. by three. And yeah. you right away went, no, they're not going to be any good. Uh, I think they're a huge surprise to me. Because, believe it or not, the Bill Snyder show is on one of my 85 million channels. <laughs> and I kind of watch it, and I'm watching it. I bet that's pretty exciting. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I think uh, them being 5-0, and I think it's the first time since 2000. They've only beaten one winning team, but they beat Baylor. Right. And Robert mm -hmm. Griffin III, who's an excellent player. Their quarterback has, uh, you know, Colin Klein's a nice player. He's kind of been the difference for them. I think you get a good quarterback, you can get good quick in college football, but the tougher part of their schedule certainly is the second right. half. If you had to look at these two teams now, I think Georgia Tech has a great shot to like be undefeated until they play Clemson at the end of October. That'll be a, a great game. That's, I'm looking forward to that. Um, <clears throat> fourth topic on the list, uh, can either one of you guys explain Florida State to me? I, I Look, I didn't think they were as good as fifth in the country. Right. I thought they were a little overrated, but not – Two and three. No, I think it's a classic example of, of overhyping a team just because they had a decent year the year before. I mean, they, you know, Christian Ponder's gone. He was a good player, good enough to be a first-round draft right. pick, and everybody threw all their eggs in the EJ Manuel basket, saying he was the, you know, the next Cam Newton. Well, obviously he's not, and the defense is is the most surprising part, I think, to me. 
Um, they have definitely underachieved. But I can't say that I'm surprised. I didn't think they'd be two and three, but I, I didn't think that they were going to be the fifth best team in the nation right. this year. Is uh, how much Mark Stoops heat is there? Well, I'm sure there is after giving up 30 points in the last two ACC games, but they did turn it over five times right. last week, and I thought he played well, did an excellent job against Oklahoma. The disappointing thing for me is they have had a horrible plan from the get-go. They got two of those exhibition games, the first two games, and refused to run the ball. They let E.J. Mm -hmm. Manuel throw it, throw, so they never got any continuity with their offensive line. They have some new guys in there on the offensive line. They switched their offensive line the week of Oklahoma and they still haven't run the ball, and then they've lost their leading rusher for the year. So they can still get healthy. Their next four games are all winnable. They can't turn the ball over, and they've got to run the football, help those quarterbacks out. Like he said, I mean, I think E.J. Manuel's pretty good, but if he's going to drop back and throw it 40 times with no run game, he's going to throw it to the other guy. I was watching Jimbo Fisher's show, and I, I found this. I don't know if he's going to catch any heat for this. The doctors told him that E.J. Manuel only play him in an emergency situation. And then he said, well, Clint Trickett was struggling, so that was an emergency to us. They put him back out there, even though he's still a herb. But, uh, you know, it, you feel like the season is slipping away from you. At the same time, like you said, Duke, Wake Forest, right. I think, no, Duke, uh, NC State, Maryland, I think are their next Boston series. College. Yeah, Boston College is just Miami. Terrible. Miami's uh, yeah. could be competitive. Well, they're definitely not going back to ACC because they lost yeah. the two teams who were three and zero. They would need those two teams to lose three times. So they're not going back to Charlotte. So the goals they have left in front of them are Miami and Florida. Miami, Florida, go to a nice bowl. Game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see if Florida's in a bowl game. That's still not a done deal yet. But I, and I, it's funny because before the season, I told we were talking about Will and and, and I with, with Jeremy and I and I I agree with we both think along the same line. This is going to be a tough year. But he's, I think he's got the personality and the recruiting to do, get it done. This, I was just saying, just get us to a bowl game, man. We got yeah. to have that week. To me, this was a, this was a seven or eight win I team eight at, the, four, at, the, yeah. at the best. I, I really felt that way going into the season. I, I still feel that way. And nothing's really happened other than maybe the, you know, margin. looking better against Tennessee than I thought we would. And the margin of the defeat the last two weeks, that's unexpected. And don't forget we lost, you know, they've lost Johnny Brantley too, you exactly. know, and I think there's a big difference for where this team would be sitting right now after two losses if he'd have played it. Like yeah, those two losses wouldn't have looked nearly as bad, I don't right. think, if John was in there. No, no question about it. And, and, and as Charlie Weiss said, he was really emerging in that first half of the Alabama. Finally, it was all coming together in the passing game. So uh, we'll see if he does, when he does come back. Finally, to our panel, uh, the biggest threat to the SEC making is six straight, Brady. Boise State. And uh, the reason is because, uh, well, first of all, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are very talented. They play each other. But if Boise gets in, the SEC is going to be looked at as a huge favorite. They're going to be told they're a favorite for six weeks. And Boise has an experienced quarterback. They love that underdog role. If they get in, which I don't think they will, they would be the only team that I could see could pull the monumental upset. You don't like Wisconsin if they get in there? Well, I picked Wisconsin before the season, but I, watching them, their defense, uh, I have Wisconsin over Alabama. Their defense, I don't think, I mean, I would want to be right and pick them if they got there. But, no, I, I looking at Alabama and LSU in person, nobody's beating those two teams. I, nobody's no, I, I, I agree with him. Unfortunately for the SEC, probably only one. Now, you never know, mm -hmm. but probably only one of those teams goes all the way. Right, but don't forget the Arkansas Razorbacks. Yeah. To, who could conceivably have one loss when it's all said and done, not play in the conference championship and be sitting there for somebody to look at. I think I've said this many times. I think there's the best offensive coach in the country, gets it done every year. They had a tough loss at Alabama, who it seems everyone has, and they got a game with LSU coming up at the end of the year. So watch out for them. So LSU beats Alabama. Arkansas beats LSU. Okie loses to Okie State, but Okie State loses. Whiskey loses somewhere. But Boise State keeps winning, Boise. just like Brady said. Yeah, I mean, that. Then we got Illinois and Boise, the Zucker. How about that? How about Illinois, <laughs> Boise, Rose Bowl? That would pack them in, wouldn't it? I think the Rose Bowl's out of having to take Boise now, right? Yeah, I don't think they have Yeah, to. they're done with that. They might have to. Arkansas could get LSU at the end, though. Yeah, no, they, they definitely could. I, and I, you know, you and I both saw um, – Alabama and LSU in person. I, I, do you agree with me that Alabama is just a notch better? Yeah, I, I would give Alabama. Remember, they're at home in that game yes. on November 5th, and also three is special. I mean, that guy, you can't sit. He was talking about simulating the offensive line. You can't simulate that running back mm -hmm. in practice. I mean, when you get hit by him, he just goes that way. Yeah. So he's good. Absolutely. All right, that's going to do it for our panel. Appreciate Noah Brindice and Brady Ackerman for coming in. We'll be right back with the list. Okay, it's time for the list. Again, I want to thank Noel Brindice and Brady Ackerman for coming in. Great stuff from them. 
And uh, no show again next week because of the open week. When we come back, we're hoping to have James Bates on the show. Urban Meyer's promised he'll come on at some point. Uh, Neil Anderson's definitely set to come on, so we'll have some great guests for you on the other side. Right now, it's time for the list, though, and what we're going to look at halfway through the season, coaches that are on the hot seat, the top five. Now, unfortunately, one of my coaches on the top five, <laughs> I was right about, but by the time I got in today, guess what? He was fired. So Mike Stoops was number one on the list. Uh, they're having just another awful year, and I you saw this coming. I'm a little surprised they did it now, but I think it's one of those, if you're going to do something, eventually do it now, the whole Jeremy Foley uh, issue. You know, that's what he liked to do like, with Ron's up, get it done, give you time to then go out and find the right guy rather than all of a sudden have to do it, save your recruiting class. Uh, that's the philosophy there. But So Mike Stoops was number one on my list. Number two, Frank Spaziani at Boston College. Uh, I, I've watched them play. I don't ever want to watch them play again. It's, it's just so awful to watch. What's amazing to me, this is why that Wake FSU game stunned me. I watched Wake play Boston College, and I went, wow, these are two really bad teams. Uh, but uh, I think there's certainly no question he's on the hot seat. Number three, Luke Fickle at Ohio State. I mean, there are stories out there already uh, that, that Urban's going to Ohio State, that Urban's going to Penn State. Uh, this, this is kind of Wake, but you know, Joe Paterno hasn't left yet. Luke Fickle hasn't left yet. But Ohio State just not looking really good. I mean, there's times when they do. And certainly, you know, the way they played for a while against Nebraska looked good. But they're going to end up with a pretty mediocre record and a pretty mediocre bowl, and that's just not acceptable up there. Look, I, I, we don't know if Luke Fickle's a good head coach or not. You cannot put a guy in that situation and expect him to do well. Guy suspended, guy suspended, guy suspended. And then it's not enough that guys are suspended. We're suspending them again for something else they did. So uh, it just hasn't gone well for Ohio State and Luke Fickle. I don't think he's going to get fired because of what he's done, but I don't think he can be the head coach because you can get somebody better. And whether that's Urban Meyer or not, we'll see. Uh, number four, Neil Calloway at Alabama, Birmingham. We saw Neil in here. This one will pain me only because uh, Kim Helton, who I like very much as his offensive coordinator, and you may have remembered the story I did on Tyson Summers, who, of course, was uh, an offensive, or I'm sorry, linebacker's coach. And his father played for them. Two really good guys, but they're only five. They just they were competitive against Mississippi State last week, but they can't score points. Their offense is just struggling, and it's it's been a long bad career in UAB for Neil Callaway. So expect him to go. All right, and at number five, I put Joker Phillips on there. I know he's only been in Kentucky for a couple of years, but when you watch Kentucky play, they're just not competitive. And I, is it Rich Brooks recruiting the Turkmen? I don't think so. Uh, Kentucky, Rich Brooks had gotten Kentucky to the point where they were a viable team. They, were, they weren't going to knock off a lot of teams. They were beating teams here and there. They would knock off an LSU once in a while. They'd knock off a South Carolina. They'd knock off a Georgia. Never beat Florida, of course. But they aren't going to beat anybody this year. They're terrible. This is one of the worst teams I've seen. And i got to think Kentucky fans are going, you know what? This coach and Wayne thing didn't work out. So I'm putting them on a hot seat. I doubt if they'll fire them. Because they're already looking at basketball season right now out there. But at the same time, I'm putting them on. His seat's a little bit warm. That's going to do it for the list and for today's show. Appreciate everybody for clicking on. Again, thanks to Noah Brindice and Brady Ackerman for being part of our panel. Well, again, we'll be off next week. No, no Beach Boys podcast. No Swampcast. No Fat Julie show. We all need that little bit of downtime. And then we'll come back ripping and roaring for the second half of the season. Until next time, Pat Julie for Laura saying so long for the Sunshine State.